and it was like the movie Armageddon. I stepped front foot on my porch and all of a sudden like pickets started getting blown off. Yeah. I had a 63 and an 84 Corvette that were both outside and um, it destroyed the 84 Corvette. Um, and the 63 did that, like, and I didn't have any shirts on them, so. But nothing's worse than being that PA that shows up with that $500,000 estimate, day one, it goes here, here, here. Success rate of settling claims and not going to litigation. Because yeah. it's become sort of the standard where let's just throw enough shit against the wall and even if nothing sticks, oh, who cares? Let's just go to litigation. And what the new guys don't understand, it's like, I don't know why, they think that just because it's going to litigation that it's going to settle. I'm like, well, first off, send him an email politely and ask him when he intended to pay for it because it's the indemnifier, not him. And in uh, 2018, the most hated email started with as per our conversation. <laughs> you look at a roof in Florida on a 32 square roof and a roof in, you know, Texas, Kansas or Fayetteville, the, the Florida roofs double, you know, the building codes drive the policy. So in my brain, okay, my world, if I have a $2,000 offer on a roof and I'm thinking it's $90,000, that's not my appraisal world. I agree. I feel appraisals are most effective when the client realizes they're subjected to a zero increase that's binding, where they pay for an umpire. There's a chance that umpire's like, man, I just ain't got it. Right. And you know, we went on our sidebar and I'm like, look, I said, it's here. I said, caucus, caucus, caucus. You know, my estimates, my estimates way over here. And he's just like, no, 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 I'll take it, I'll take it. I'm like, are you sure? Because there's other steps that we can take. And it happened twice. Uh, I mean, one and a half. The other one wasn't too bad, but one of them was just like, I mean, he took just way less than what I think he should have, but you know. What's up, advocates? And welcome back to the Claims Game Podcast, episode nine. Today, we're gonna interview Frank Dalton of Coastal Claims. But before I get into that, and that amazing interview. Uh, remember that we're sponsored by Fortez Health. Fortez Health sells PPE equipment, all kinds of masks and face shields and so on and so forth, gloves, whatever you need. And, you know, whether whether you don't want to get COVID or you don't want to give away COVID, or honestly, if you work for a mold remediation company, uh, you're going to need some of these PPE products. So I highly recommend this company. It's a fantastic company. It's actually a close personal friend of mine that runs it. And, um, you know, uh, another thing is any PPE products that you purchase, it actually you're actually donating to a good cause, which is you're donating to frontline workers. So what Fortes Health does is for, there's a, a percentage and a portion of everything that everything that is por everything that is purchased, they actually donate PPE products to frontline workers. So you're also giving back to a good cause if you purchase on Fortes Health. And we give you a discount. If you purchase Fortes Health uh, PPE products, you get 20% off by putting the code VINCE20. So put in the code VINCE20 at checkout and you will get 20% off. So not too bad. Today, we are interviewing Frank Dalton. Frank Dalton is the owner of Coastal Claims. Coastal Claims is a big public adjusting firm in New Smyrna Beach. I actually met Frank a couple of weeks ago. And let me tell you, his operation is top notch. It is intense. I mean, he's got, I think he said anywhere from 40 to 50 adjusters working. He's got He's got uh, field adjusters, desk adjusters. He's got an appraisal department, an estimating department, a, a litigation department. I mean, it's like he runs this place like an insurance company. And the reason why is he worked for the other side for over 15 years. He did all kinds of field work. He did desk work. He was an independent adjuster for very, very long on the carrier side. So he knows a lot and he knows the inner workings of what is going on on the other side. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. So I think it's going to be really beneficial for anybody who's looking to get some really, really, uh, really detailed knowledge on policy and coverages. And um, um, uh, we're talking um, uh, ordinance and law, and we're talking mediations and appraisals and uh, just how you're supposed to set up your claim. We were talking about how we settle 90% of our claims and we don't go to litigation. Think about that, guys. To some of you, that just blew your mind, right? Yeah, it could happen. So check out this interview. It's really fantastic. It's basically just, you know, two experienced public adjusters having a great conversation. So if you can enjoy that, I think you'll enjoy this. So go ahead, check it out. You Oh, you could find Frank on Facebook and you could find Frank on LinkedIn. And if you want to check out at least a little bit of what his operation is all about, check out the website. It's um, www.coastalclaims.net. That's .net, not .com. So check it out whenever you can. Check out this podcast. I really enjoyed it and I think you will too. So Let's go to the intro. Yo, 
Welcome to the Claims Game Podcast with Vince Perry. Get all the tips you need from insurance claim advocates and professionals and grow your public adjusting career to the next level. And now the commercial claims advocate, Vince Perry. All right. What's up, Frank? Hey man, how you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, man. It's uh, I'm excited to have you on here because um, we spoke. I went over to your office. What was it? Just last week, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, we were introduced by Pate. Pate was like, "You gotta meet Frank. If there's anybody that you have to meet, you gotta meet Frank." Because I was gonna go to that. I went to that SVG event, and I had called you before, and I was just like, "Oh man, Frank, are you going?" And then you called me later because you got a little busy and you weren't able to do it. But um, I'm really glad that I was able to go check out your operation because you've got quite the operation, man. Thanks. Yeah, no, I'm the stinky side. I gotta get paid five bucks every time he tells people how cool I am. But no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a neat infrastructure. I think the the one on one that you and I had was a lot cooler than getting to meet the first time and in, inside of a a function. And it, you know, it's raw and organic. You're sitting here in the office and people popping in asking questions. But uh, it just, I was absolutely amazed to see how parallel. Uh, your and I's and a few other people on Matt's vision for public adjusting, helping one another, getting out there, you know, talking. And so many people think everyone's, you know, six guns out in the street and we're all up against each other. So what I wanted to say was I'm really, I'm really actually excited that you mentioned that. Uh, one of the things that we're doing here with the commercial claims advocate, I'm getting so much support. It's first of all, ridiculous. I mean, and I'm not afraid to mention it because it is humbling to me. Like I'm just doing this because I've got some ideas in, in regards to educating public adjusters and stuff. And it's sort of how I started with the idea, but then I got into just, you know, wanting to educate public adjusters just with the, with the medium. But the response that I'm getting is tremendous. So what we've been doing now is we've been doing meetups. We did one in Miami. We did one in Pensacola and we did one in Tampa. And the sole purpose was like you're saying is for us to just sort of get together because it doesn't make any sense from when I first started that public adjusters are always sort of in competition. And I don't think that's what it should be. You know, technically, quote unquote, I guess you are competition because you're doing what I'm doing. But if we could instead sort of gather our forces, talk shop and sort of get together in a way and educate ourselves with just sort of your processes, my processes, because everybody's got a sort of different way of looking at things and we have different experiences. And if we could combine those forces, it's only going to help the policyholder. It's only going to help the homeowner, the business owner to make sure that they've got everything set up and we've got everything set up to hit the insurance company where it hurts. Yeah, no, you, you, boy, you're hitting on like 13 topics I just want to dive into. But, uh, you know, I, I know a handful of attorneys and I didn't any name drop on these, but uh, there's one in particular. And uh, he goes, man, I pick up a claim, uh, you know, in litigation for another attorney that I saw because they were they were going down the wrong road. And he goes, I did it for him, didn't charge him, gave him all the money, the whole shebang type thing. I, I, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but um, it wasn't about you know that, that old joke it wasn't about walking down the hill and getting or running down the hill and getting one it's walking down and getting them all you get in there and you can help somebody get down that right road and and get there it really helps the industry as a whole um i see a lot of people and something i've been preaching all that kind of become the one trick pony in this conversation but you know that ordinance and law and getting out there and 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 taking the easy road on o and l the florida specific of course and uh you know, and, and getting a roof on that, and that works great until the next client doesn't have O and L, and you just, you know, really messing up your argument. Heaven forbid it's the same carrier, you know. So Ela elaborate on that a little bit, Frank, because you're super, super knowledgeable on the on the policy itself and everything and the way it's written. Because I know you worked on the other side for a long time. So if you could elaborate on your experience uh, or what you're talking about in regards to um, uh, to ordinance and law. Yeah, I see, I see a lot of guys, and uh, mostly contractors, but a lot of newer PAs, making that argument on a three-tab, 20-year shingle. And everyone assumes automatically that three-tab shingles are, you know, they're not compliant. Then they make a they make a 20 or a 25-year shingle that is. Uh, but a, a three-tab, 20-year shingle, and they're making that argument. Well, there's one damage shingle, and the carrier says, oh, we don't know for the rest. And they just go back and they say, uh, well, you know, you got to, because it's a 20-year shingle, and you got to pay for it under ordinance and law. And they, they write the, you know, that fake roof in this scenario. They write that roof at 10000 under L and L. But the reality is, you go back and make that argument of replacement cost, non-repairability, if it's factual, of course. And, you know, then you have $8,000 for the roof. 
and you got a two thousand dollar cost increase for right, the modern right, shingle. Right, right, right. Gotcha. $2, is that something you've experienced a lot with the uh, in Pensacola? The I'm assuming. Roof. Uh, yeah, Pensacola, the Panhandle, also where we live over here on the on the East Coast. And a lot of times that argument, the way we find the claim as a roofing contractor has already argued it to that point. So now, you know, you're already you're already five houses down that one way street. It's kind of hard to back up and, you know, look in the rear view mirror the whole time. Um, you know, that, that whole goose and gander theory, is, it, it applies. And you know, the carriers only got one chance to deny a claim. They only got one chance to do this, one chance to do that. Well, you know, our arguments are kind of based on that one chance. You know, we can we can always pivot as needed. But, you know, you get you get far enough down a hallway. You're, you're kind of you are where you are, you know. O and L. <laughs> there we go. Uh, cost incurred. So how do you how do you set that thing up and sort of how do you take it? And, and also, I don't want I know because you have so much information. I don't want to ask you all these different things. I say I talk a lot sometimes, but I guess also setting it up with the roofer and everything. Yeah, no, I mean, so when I look at doing these things, I'm certainly it's uh, I'm with you. This is this is so someone can get some organic information, get out there in the field and use it and apply it. Yes. So here's my theory. Every roof that we tap foot on, we look at no matter what anyone has said before, I don't allow it to prejudice our opinion. We go out there assuming the roof can be repaired and we're trying to look and see if there's damages related to that loss, yeah, you know, per the reported loss that is, a, you know, fits into that box and it- ADPL, that accidental direct physical loss. Once we've established that, if a roof appears to be repairable, I always speak with the, the adjuster and I let them know, hey, we, you know, we're willing to give repair a stab. I am not a building contractor. I'm not a roofing contractor. We're going to give it the best run, but here's where we think we might be. Um, if we know going in that there's no chance of repair, then why waste everyone's time, you know? But nothing's worse than being that PA that shows up with that $500,000 estimate day one and goes, here, here, here. Man, I I promise you, if you try that every time you're going to get an engineer, you're going to get a professional, you're going to get a ladder assist. Like I, you know, you meet out there and the guy goes, Hey man, I see 25 bad shingles. I'm going to write for 25 bad shingles. Let them write for it. Extend the coverage. Maybe they're right. Maybe it can be repaired, but if not, then yes, on that first next step, we're going in with a built and compiled estimate, failed roof repair, you know, materials, non-compliant, whatever the scenario may be. And, and the O and L is separated in coverages. No different than you would see other structures. Where do you get that dollar amount? Where do you get that number? Exactly. So most declaration pages are going to be, you know, and a lot of guys, I'm amazed that come in and they go, Hey, I got the policy and they have the declaration pages, you know, normally deck pages, is three to four pages max. Sometimes it's one, you know, any indicators of that should be on there. Uh, it's carrier specific. Some of them, they do bury it down a little bit. A lot of them are going to be in that check mark boxes on pages three and four, you know, and it, you know, this coverage acts yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. So that's where you're going to look for those indicators. And there are some policies that's just traditionally in there and you got to look for an affidavit towards the end of it if they bought increased O and L. So policy is king. Policy is king. Uh, I, I like how you I like how you mentioned getting coverage, getting coverage extended. Uh, if there's a way that you can make a repair, you can make a repair. One of the things that we were talking about last week, which I know you mentioned in uh, in Pate's podcast as well, was our success rate of settling claims and not going to litigation because it's become sort of the standard where let's just throw enough shit against the wall and even if nothing sticks oh who cares let's just go to litigation and what the new guys don't understand it's like i don't know why they think that just because it's going to litigation that it's going to settle a lot of these attorneys cannot settle some of this shit that they're get they're being given they can't they can't do it or they settle for peanuts like just complete garbage just for it to walk just for it to go away you got to set up the claim correctly yeah no you do and um you know 
it's it's like any industry you have your percentages you know and you have your one percenters and your ten percenters and and people that do things that they shouldn't and this 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 type of scenario we're not we're not speaking for those people um you know the majority of our estimates we settle within 85 90 percent of our initial ask um i it amazes me when i see a guy produce you know a ninety thousand dollar estimate his expectations of settlement were twenty seven thousand um i don't you know, <laughs> what's the point <laughs> like uh, I, I think there's actually some things there i would let attorney speak of there like, might be some fraudulent behavior but right yeah so you know we really try to get that number there i i oftentimes joke like our estimates at our firm it's like a carrier estimate with no guidelines like you see these carrier guidelines that say you can only paint a wall once you can only affect the nine square foot of De- detach texture. detach and reset here detach and reset there yeah so you know we ignore guidelines. We have internal guidelines we've created. We think it's appropriate for repair based off building codes. Um, but that's normally the difference between uh, uh, one of our estimates. And I, I assume yours are probably the same way. Most, right. most BAs that are doing their, doing this full time, they're, they're paying attention to that. And, and that that's an attributing factor to success. So when I was a staff guy or when I was on that side, I hated nothing more than getting, you know, Hey, what's the loss? Well, I don't know. I haven't been here yet. Well, give me a minute to go talk to the client. And then it's like, Oh, here's a roofing estimate. Um, you know, the house is valued at 313,000 worth 393 for total loss for the roof. And I'm like, well, is there water stains? There's two tea stains in the living room. I'm like, probably at 393,000, you know, you wasted paper, man. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I think getting those estimates to where they're palatable. Um, and again, there are some roofs that can be repaired. There is some tile that can be repaired. Like repair is possible. And can if it happens, it happens. That's great. Can you give me an example of something like that? Maybe a, a claim that you had that you ended up just doing the repair client was okay. And everybody sort of walked away happy and everything was good. I can't actually. Yeah. We had a carrier and then, you know, they were, they were non-responsive to us and uh, you know, you send demands, send demands, you know, can you send me the policy? Can you, and like in our sworn proof or our initial LOR, there's a request for the policy and all claims documentation. Ours too. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it just saves you that extra few weeks. But anyways, um, won't talk, won't talk, won't talk. Finally, the carrier gets on the phone. She was very curt, very abrupt. And she, you know, just couldn't say nothing nice. And I, I keep it loose. I'm like, hey, how's it going today? You know, how's your day going? It's a Friday. You know, <laughs> yes, I don't really care what day it is. You know, Mr. Dalt, please act professionally. I'm like, okay, you know. And it, it turns out, and she's like, well, you know, we know UPAs are just there to drive these up. And it's just quite honestly, it's not my priority to get a hold of you. And we'll, we'll take it in the order as needed. I have other clients that don't have PAs intentionally inflating the claim. And I asked her, I go, man, did you even open our estimate? And she's like, no. And I'm like, our ask is $2,747. And she's like, well, why? And I said, well, because you guys paid for, I think it, you guys paid for 0.25 squares and no no truck, no dumpster, no nothing. I said, the roofer's already gone out and perfected the repair. We have the invoice and the client's still willing to pay us because you ignored it for months. You know, well, why are you repairing the roof? And I'm like, because it was an eight-year-old, arch- eight-year-old architectural shingle and they, they went out and repaired it. And, you know, it still took like six weeks to get the check. Wow. Like, Good for you, man. Good What's for you. Angle? I'm like, there's no angle. Good for you. I mean, and I'm the same way when I talk to these adjusters. I try to make them I try to make them feel as comfortable as possible. I mean, yeah, yesterday I got a call from an adjuster. Thankfully, we ended up having a 45 minute conversation just about the industry. And, you know, he's just getting sick and tired and sort of fed up with the whole thing anyway of all the crap Every that he's blue moon, I'll still get him and they'll go, is this Frank? And, you know, was your alias? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, man, we work together in New York. I'm right. Like, hey, how's it going? I, you know? I, you're not going to believe this. I had a guy yesterday. He's like, wait, are you Vince? I'm like, yeah. He's like, dude, my best friend just signed up for your course. And I'm like, wow, that's a, that's quite a small (laughs) world. (laughs) I had one about a year ago, uh, two years ago, uh, a cause and origin, cause and origin fire inspector came out. He's fire marshal, hardcore guy, big old cowboy hat at 450, you know, I get out and I'm like, Hey man, what's going on? You know, hit it off real well. And he's just real sterile. And I have an uncle that's fire marshal out in California. They're very different breed. You know, they're, they're looking for, they look at people that get hurt. They're looking 
looking at things we don't see, you know. And I uh, just could not get this guy to crack a smile. <laughs> Gets done. And he's like, hey, turns out the client didn't start this fire. I found the source. It's under the fridge. A, a rat had climbed into the fridge, clogged it up, caught on fire. And uh, I'm like, cool, man. Thanks a lot. And this and that. And he's like, oh, he says, I appreciate your honesty. And, you know, appreciate this. And I, I literally, I'm leaving there. And the guy, his sister calls me. And she goes, hey, uh, my brother's so-and-so. And I go, uh, I don't know if I know him. She goes, oh, he's a fire marshal. And he does inspections. And I go, oh, I just left an inspection with him. I'm like, what's up? And she goes, I got a roof claim that's like four months old and the insurance company won't call me. <laughs> he, he, he referred my card out. I'm like, oh, that's great. Look at that. There you go. Yeah. It just show, goes to show, just be nice. Just be kind. Just be nice to people. Be cordial to people. And you can get a long way with that. Just a long way, especially with the other side, with the carrier. Big time. You know, and remember, you know, they're humans. People have good days. They have bad days. You know, it's like, just be human. Exactly. That's what I tell these people all the time. Like, just don't. And the, my favorite ones are the ones that as soon as I make the call, like you said, and as soon as they answer the phone, they're just like coming out. Okay, I'm about to have a conversation with a public adjuster. I'm going to need to get really angry and I'm going to stand my ground and I'm going to dig my heels in here. And I'm just like, hey, how's it going? How's everything going? Like I do. It's Friday. Hey, we got the weekend coming. Are you working hard or hardly working? That's the one I use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got a case of the Monday. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you Five. worked you worked on the other side for a while, right? For about fifteen years, I think you said. Yeah. Tell yeah. me, tell me a little bit about that. Ah, uh, crazy man. Um, it's like literally. <laughs> having your competition educate you. So <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've got, so like carrier guidelines, that's a good one. You, you already know the carrier guidelines, don't you? Like, I don't have that list. I mean, I just I know imagine, from experience. Well, I don't have any lists. I, I will say when I left the carrier side, I actually took the computer I used and took it to a recycling facility because I didn't ever want to get accused of using their documents. Uh, didn't print anything. You know, the temptations there, but I thought, you know what? You, 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 why do it? It's, it's, it's unethical. Yeah, but in your good. head. You got what's in your brain. Right. And also knowing that when I worked at carriers, you know, you help write this or you give input or they do this. That. They change them constantly anyways. It's always a new shtick. You know, I, there was a couple of insurance companies that I worked for. You could always tell when a new manager came in because all of a sudden Joe's insurance company started to act exactly like Bob's insurance company. And then all of a sudden, two years later, you were Dave's insurance company, you know. So depending on whatever manager they get in or this or that or the other, it really changes the effect of it. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Um, sorry, it's accounts receivable. That's cool. Huh? Something. <laughs> so, you know, you just store it in your head. Uh, claims practices. The, the biggest thing that I think I took from that side was, uh, and I had one of my uh, guys here, Brandon, the other day came in. He's like, hey, man, uh, you know, I just got the phone the carrier and they said they don't pay for starter shingles and they don't pay for ridge cap and, uh, or he doesn't. And I'm like, well, first off, send him an email politely and ask him when he intended to pay for it because it's the indemnifier, not him. And I said, then <laughs> recapitulate this in an email to him and get him to either affirm or deny that he said that. And then as soon as he does that, respond back to him and ask him to show you where in the policy it says they don't pay for starter shingles. And, um, you know, that's one of those things that that's it, that fine line between uh, phone calls and documentation, I think. And, uh, 2018, the most hated email started with as per our conversation, <laughs> but that's, you know, you got to document it. You got to preserve it, get it back up there. Um, it, I, every carrier was so different. Um, I, you know, I got a lot of exposure to managed repair stuff. I got a lot of exposure to, um, you know, different companies doing different values. I'm trying to stay Florida specific here. So my brain's kind of running through the States. Um, commercial was big, you know, so you spend the first couple of years as an IA begging to work. I mean, begging to work. And then there's finally a storm that's so bad or so widespread that you get to work the next storm because the other guys, the A team's already out working, you know what I'm saying? Right. And then you finally get out there and you work some claims. And I think you spend every dime you have and you get there and then you work for about three weeks and then you finally get paid for them, which is appropriate per the contract, you know, and then they send you home. 
home and then you, you don't work again for a few months and then slowly you start to build momentum and you get known and you start working. So for me, I was already a year and a half, two years deep before I really started working. And, and, and I, I treated it like a job. Like I, I, there was my nine to five. I went home, I had a computer exact made. I was, you know, doing whatever. And, um, when was know, this Frank? When, when, you, you know, I started doing expert work and stuff like that. And like, Oh, three Oh four and started looking at getting licensed. Oddly enough, my dad had uh, gotten a South Carolina license and we, I grew up in an area of Missouri <clears throat> in my young childhood, we we're on the river. So like my childhood went through like four floods. So I heard about insurance my whole life. And then, uh, um, I think 2001 or two late 2000, there was a massive hailstorm that hit St. Louis. I mean, just, I remember coming home and I'd, I'd left working at the airport. I had a construction company. We we're doing a flooring job at the airport and my guys were running behind. So I actually physically went to work that day. And it was like the movie Armageddon. I stepped front foot on my porch and all of a sudden like pickets started getting blown off. Yeah. I had a 63 and an 84 Corvette that were both outside and um, it destroyed the 84 Corvette um, and the 63 did, like, and I didn't have any insurance on them. So oh my slowly, slowly God. fix them myself. Um, but you know, I lived there my whole life. You see hail once or twice and it's this size, you know? Um, so that kind of got me into it. And then, uh, you know, at the time I was looking at selling, I had a, a union uh, flooring and interior finish company. I'd done some expert work. I'd sat on some boards with the ALF CIO, uh, the National Flooring Association uh, of North America and the Tile Industry Council of North America. I, I, I had to look back, make sure I got the ABC acronym of them correct and help write some technical manuals and bylaws and how to install this and how to do that, blah, blah, blah. So I started getting used for some of that in court cases. Cases. Uh, we did a lot of work for, um, uh, I did a lot of work against um, a, a big box store that does sells home improvement stuff. Um, and then, you know, my dad had gotten his South Carolina license and, uh, you know, he's like, you need to look into this. So I started there and started progressively moving forward and just, you know, it takes some time. So, so you were in Missouri and then, uh, you don't have to stay Florida specific, by the way, as a matter of fact, I mean, we've got listeners from all over. So, I mean, if you want to get into other, uh, if you, I'm just saying you don't have to be Florida specific whatsoever. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah. And then in, in, uh, late 04, early 05, I, I sold that company and I, I moved on to Florida full time. Um, you know, you first get to Florida, you spend the first year or so want to keep your feet in the sand. And on the beach. And yeah. yeah. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> and then slowly started progressing into it more. Started getting really active probably around 2000. And I mean, working, working, getting called out, demanded 2007, 2008. So you're talking, uh, you're talking Wilma. I'd say you, did you do a lot of Wilma stuff or not really? Uh, I tried not to. I tried to run dailies at first and then realized that um, when you're a noob <laughs> and working dailies, you don't work much. And then uh, I got into this niche working in the Midwest. So I spent like a lot of time when all, you know, I, I wasn't an A player at the time. So all the, all the high guys were down there and I would get like, Fayetteville and uh, West Memphis, Arkansas, and uh, New York. What are uh, what are some of the major differences that you see in those policies? Because I know there's a lot of similarities too. But what are some of the major differences you would say? Uh, and the other regions lack of lack of decent and stringent building codes, so the the policies are not driven to protect against building code. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, that's my opinion. I, there might be a whole other matrix why, but um, you know, you look at a roof in Florida on a 32 square roof and a roof in you know Texas, Kansas, or Fayetteville, the, the Florida roofs double. You know, the building codes drive the policy, and then therefore that that coveted O and L kicks in. Right. And uh, you know, it, it it just it's a different beast down here. And is there no O and L coverage at all in some of these states? No, I think there is, but the codes are like right now we've got one in North Carolina that uh, does have O and L, but the only thing that's applicable is a second layer of ice and water shield in the valley. What? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they just, they, they, there's, and I'm making an argument right now, some defacement of uh, metals that go behind some siding and stuff, but that is, they're not as strong in my opinion as they are here. I mean, in Florida, a building code says any metal trim flashing, etc. that's, you know, been damaged or shows a defacement or corruption erosion. Well, they get defaced when people nail them down. So damaged when they get installed and reusing them and re-nailing them is 
less likely. Um, it seems at other states, you know, you call and you ask a building department a question and they're like, yeah, you know, we ain't got to do it unless you come in and make us mad type thing. You know, it's like, and what's, geez. what's some of the steps that you take in order to, to show the insurance company, um, in, in uh, just in regards to the building code and what needs to be paid and so on and so forth. Uh, do you just go directly to the building, uh, to the building department? Do you get a roofer to sort of get that for you provided in their estimate, their repair bill? Or what's some of, some of the strategies you use? Man, that's a great question. So is what I found the most useful tool is we normally will go to the building department and, um, you know, those guys are stretched thin. They're, they're working guys and gals are working like crazy. So I'll try to take something in on our letterhead with a picture of what I'm talking about and say, Hey, you know, um, do you feel this is this? And they're like, yeah, you know, yeah, the building code does say it that way. And, uh, you know, and I'd tell them like, why well, this might be an insurance claim. And if we're just trying to find out the right step, the contractor said this, the insurance carrier said that, you know, and no, I, I, I'm going to make them do that. And they're like, okay, would you mind putting your name and information here, contact information, signing this? And yeah, that's no problem. Tell them to give me a call. You know, here you go. And then, you know, send that off. So a lot of times the, there's people the carrier that want to indemnify for these things and they can't pay for what ifs. Um, I, you know, and I joke in this industry where, you know, for me, the, the thing that works in my head, we're all kind of one trick ponies. We got, you know, two or three things we're really good at. And then we borrow from other people for smart. One of my one trick pony things is, is like granite countertops in a kitchen. You know, if you're dealing with the rock and I think it's like ignorant rocks are a little bit more dense. If you do something real veiny, like a Carrera marble or something, that one's more likely and susceptible to crack when it gets detached and reset. Sure. But going to the insurance company day one and going, you got to pay for it. They're going to crack. They can't pay for what ifs. And it's the same on the roof. You know, you got to give them some tools because there's a lot of those guys and gals that are, they want to pay the claim properly. You know? So I'm like you, I, 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 I try to surround myself with these experts because you've got a lot more, you've got a, obviously a lot of construction experience. Me personally, I don't really have much of anything except for what I've learned throughout my public adjusting career for the last uh, 14 years. So it's just what I've learned sort of on the job. So it's not I, by no means any kind of construction expert. So I try to surround myself <laughs> with good roofers, with good contractors. Uh, I try to know people in the building department to make sure that I have, I have places to go so that I could provide this documentation. And one thing I realized is, is you're right. I can have all the construction experience in the world. Unless I'm a licensed general contractor and I can show that, which I'm really, that's which I'm not. So unless I can do that, it's not going to really hold much weight anyway, unless I could provide it with some actual documentation from the actual expert. That's what I've done. Yeah, who else is going to enforce the building code than the building department? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've had roofers and this running joke about pitch and dead wood. I think I stole that from like the movie, the boiler room or something, but you don't pitch that wood, man. You got to have good product. And I've had roofers come to me and they're, Oh, you got to do this. You have to do this. You can't do that. And I'm like, all right, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in your con you know, in your congregation. And you're, you're saying what you got to do it. Yeah. And then I, then I go to a building department. The guy's like, who the hell told you that? It's like, Oh man, come on. On. Yeah. Um, our fights and our arguments, you know, like a lot of guys will sit and watch my mediations and stuff. And I can just say from watching you in the past and watching, you know, Matt and Matthew and a few other guys and Jack and, you know, everybody seems to be really good at what they're doing when they're passionate. <laughs> Nothing will strip your passion worse than looking over and going, these people had to move out of their house and da 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 da. And, the, and then they go, sir, I was out there. They're living in a 590 thousand dollar rv they own and you look at the lady and you go is that true and she goes well yeah but you know we didn't want to live in it i'm like oh man yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, you mentioned you mentioned mediation. That's funny. I know we talked about that. We should do some kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should like set that up. I think that would be pretty cool. We could probably do it like on a whole Zoom thing too. Uh, yeah. But what we were talking about last week was that, man, I'm with you, man. Mediation has has been working out a lot better than it used to. It Loving used to it. it used to be such a waste of time. Oh, mediation? Oh, hell no. Forget that. Why am I going to waste my time? But you know they want to they want to keep um, which it, it's I'd say it's it's happening at about a thirty percent clip. But they like to reject my appraisal. Request. I'm an appraisal guy. I love to go to appraisal. I'm like, let's, we have let's a whole do appraisal it. department. I love appraisal. Oh. Do it. But it's like dress shoes. They, there's a certain time you use them. You right. Know, that you, right. So, well, give me an example for you. I'd like to, I'd like to pick your brain about that. When do you like to use them? Oh, uh, 
uh, giving away some strategies here. Hopefully, uh, the people that are watching take it for, for what it's worth. So, in my brain, okay, my world, if I have a two thousand dollar offer on a roof and I'm thinking it's ninety thousand dollars, that's not my appraisal world. I, agree. I feel appraisals are most effective when the client realizes they're subjected to a zero increase that's binding where they pay for an umpire. There's a chance that umpire is like, man, I just ain't got it. Right. So clients got to be very aware. It's like stocks, you know, it's investments. One's a little higher risk than the other one. So, but one, you know, the, the rewards are greater on the high risk. So um, primarily I'm a huge fan of alternative dispute resolution, and I'm not a big fan of pushing my claims to litigation. When I worked for carriers, I had such a distaste in my mouth for the public adjuster that 99.999% of all of his claims went to, you know, Dewey Cheatham and Howe or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but in my world, my appraisal market, it's, it's for closing the gap. It's for, it's for the extra oomph you need. It's, it's, it's getting that person that's got the, the handcuffs on and they're being told by management, I can't move you any further forward. Then it's a great tool. Um, I believe there's people that use appraisal inappropriately on both sides. I have a specific carrier. I can demand appraisal three times. They won't do it. Go to mediation. It fails. Then you go to litigation because the client wants it and they pick a lawyer and all that good jazz. And then what's the first thing they do? Demand appraisal. Ah. (laughs) Yeah, I've had that happen too. So when a carrier uses it that way, in my opinion, I think it's dirty pool. Sure. Good on them, but dirty pool. I also have a lot of carriers here lately that I had one yesterday reviewed with one of our appraisers and I don't run our appraiser department. We have a guy here named Ben that does that. But so when I work in appraisals here, I work for him. Um, but I had one of the guys the other day I was reviewing with and you know, I'm like, where's the estimate? Well, we requested it nine times from the carrier. I'm like, were we on this claim from start? No, we weren't the PA. The client came to us because the carrier demanded appraisal. I'm like, okay, well, where's this? Well, we don't have it. Where's this? And I'm like, you made a request? I'm like, yeah, I made a ton of them. They're all in writing. So we call the other appraiser. He sends over the estimate and uh, I get it. I look at it. And I go, what are we appraising? And they go, well, the roof. And I go, they didn't pay the roof. They denied it. I'm like, you can't appraise it tonight, Right, right. I, I call the other appraiser up and he's like, uh, well, I think we can at least look at it. And I'm like, right, no, I'm not going to entertain that. I said, call the examiner back and have them open a roofing labor minimum charge or something. You know, make it appraisable. Right. Do something. Right. You know, and he goes, well, the appraisal's tomorrow. And I go, this is the first we got. It was just now. I'm right. like, you know. So, that's a huge risk. I, I mean, that's a huge risk. Are you kidding? me because once you once you agree to go to that and you're there at the appraisal and they're just completely denying it and you know he's going to throw it back in your face and say well why well, i'm not even going to look at the roof and if that's where the biggest discrepancy is that, that was the only discrepancy we were you're screwed. on the interior and the worst part is i think there's a ton of attorneys that would jump in and say hey you're practicing law if you're you know arguing a denied object right you know, right at that, at that level you know what i'm saying oh i was gonna so, say because i i argue denials all the time yeah at that level you know i i, I think once you get to a point of exhausting it i mean there's a reason and that the standardized appraisal says you can't appraise a denied object. You right, know, like, right, exactly. Uh, you're, you're playing mini court at that time. Um, so I don't know. I, appraisals for me, they're closing the small gap. It's a great tool. Um, I was literally thrown to the wolves on my first appraisal. Um, the firm I was working with, um, so when I first started, I, I worked for another PA firm for a short period of time. Great people. Um, but they just never had done an appraisal. And I got one, they demanded appraisal. I'm like, you know, I knew appraisal from the carrier side sure like, I mean, you know, get, but it, it, went, it went well and then um i get obsessive about studying about stuff so the second that happened you know i spent the next subsequent 60 nights up in bed till two in the morning reading about everything you can about appraisals and, oh you know, nice reaching out to people and uh i'm gonna you know, have to send the guys you that some. are getting started in appraisal it's you get all of someone like that it's gonna call me it's really not much different than just going on an inspection I, there's i think people i got one of my guys he's going out on his first one and I'm training them as best I can and just getting them prepared. And I'm like, at the end of the day that you got to pay your dues, you got to do it eventually because the appraisal, the appraisal, the, the appraisers that you meet, you know, they've got a lot more experience. It's just a little bit of a different feel. Uh, it's very relationship based. I think like uh, my appraisals now compared to the way they were a long time ago, it's just, I just have a much better success rate now directly with the appraiser than I sort of did in the beginning. And I think it's just because, you know, you got more, you got more experience. You sort of know what you're talking about a little bit more and I know a lot of the guys now too. And I will say too for any guys starting out in a 
numbers. I'm not going to drop their names here because they might get mad. It's a PA driven show, but the two people that probably gave me the most mentorship and appraisals are both carrier appraiser and carrier umpire. That's awesome. And I mean, I literally have done work for a contractor before is hey, we're forced to be an appraisal. Can we hire you? And I say, this is the umpire we choose. And they go, there's no way you can select him. He's, he only works for carriers. I'm like, if it wasn't for this man, I wouldn't know what I'm doing. That's awesome. You know, so your remark about all about the relationships and in appraisals in particular, in particular, yes, is paramount. Um, Yeah. It just, it makes the difference. And I've gotten screwed. I ain't going to lie. I had an appraisal. I'll never forget. I just could not agree with the appraiser. He was giving me shit about missing walls. And I'm like, come on. And then we went to the umpire and the umpire, he agreed to pay for one box of the kitchen cabinets as opposed to all of them that we had in there. And I called him the next day and I'm like, did you make a mistake here? He's like, no, you know, you know, these people aren't going to use the money to do the the cabinets anyway. They're not going to replace all their cabinets. And I'm like, wait a minute. These people. Yeah. And I'm like, and I I just couldn't believe it. And you know, that's just a terrible phone call to make to the client. It's like, uh, we're done. We we can't get any more, you know? Yeah. So whatever. But you know, you got to go through those things. It's like, I was telling my guy, I'm just like, it should work out Uh, at the meetup we had the other day. I had a guy who he went to appraisal and what people don't understand either is people think that when you go to appraisal that you're trying to just get more money. The actual definition of appraisal is you're actually just re- assessing, reappraising the entire thing from the beginning. So if you've got an appraiser that goes out there and he doesn't think that that roof is covered anymore or doesn't have damage or that floor doesn't have damage, he could easily decide we're not even going to write it up. So this poor guy, this poor guy got one of those guys and the appraiser's estimate was less than the initial, initial, uh, initial carrier's, uh, estimate. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's some angles there you need to make. Yeah. Yeah. So some angles. Yeah. Is that, you know, you know, I think a beautiful thing would be, uh, you know, respected to Xactimate, which is a proprietary system everyone uses. I mean, I'm so old. I know how to use MSB and SimSaw. And I love SimSaw. I grew up on, I, all I used was SimSaw throughout my whole career until now. <laughs> a lot of dr- drilling up and drilling down in the program. But, right, uh, exactly. You know, <laughs> if they just would run a program and for a year that had no prices associated with it, I think you'd see a lot of the fraud in the industry leveling out. I'll be hated for saying that, but you know, you should almost have to hit enter and pay your subscription before you see the price list. Because I know way too many people, both sides that sit there and do that. And I I get this all the time. I get the cocky, I know better than you, everything adjuster for the insurance company. And I'm one of those guys, I grew up in the country, but guys that hunt stuff don't identify with me. I grew up in, you know, the city, but you know, swanky, fancy people. I'm just like this middle of the road America guy, you know, and I don't really identify as any like, hey, go Cubs or, you know, any of that stuff. And okay. Throw that go Cubs out there for Jack Hanks. But uh, <laughs> he gets out of the truck and it's just, you know, and he, his, his defense to the clients, I always try to set up expectations. So I get the adjuster there, I get the client there and I say, look, I'm going to set some rules of engagement real quick. We're not going to do any interviews right now. We're not going to do this. He has questions. He can ask me, I can ask you. I'm not going to stop him from speaking directly to you. However, it's your choice if you want him to speak to me and da, 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 da. I go through that and I say, furthermore, please don't sit here and hammer him about questions about money. He does not have the ability to write a check right here, right now. I said it'd take about two weeks for him to finish their file and an additional couple of weeks for the insurance carrier to respond. So we're at the beginning of about a three to five week road right now on a, on a best case scenario. Does anyone have any questions? And, uh, you know, normally the client will go, well, you know, is it, are you trying to write as low as estimate as you can? And I love this response, ma'am, I get paid more the more I write. And I go, oh, wait a minute, let's be fair. You get paid one dollar a mile from one or zero to three thousand, one from zero to five thousand, one from five to nine thousand. And I said, and that works out great till about fourteen thousand. And now you got to go from fourteen to twenty five and from twenty five to thirty five and from thirty. And I said, now these steps are so big when you're sitting there pounding them keys in, you know, you you only have, you're only incentivized on a $29,000 loss to write it above 25 at that point, because you've hit the next fee schedule. And, uh, well, yeah, but you know, I don't do that. And I'm like, well, you know, I worked on that side and I heard enough barroom talk that I know it happens. See, that's you know? the advantage to working on the other side. You, you know, all these yeah. exact little numbers. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> 
So, you know, I always tell the client, you know, we get paid on every penny we get yet. Let's be very clear. Yeah. You're paying our fees. Yes. You know, you, there's a reason you had to hire us and you're going to pay our fees. But every penny that we fight for you, that's legitimate. It's there. And I mean, I hear guys all the time doing it. Perfect. Doing it perfect. I am here to get you absolutely everything I can under the terms of the policy for what has been damaged and what you're owed for. And man, when you live in that world, it feels really comfortable. And I had a client the other day to do a Zoom with. <laughs> My door's damaged. I'm like, was it damaged for the storm? What's well, just it's damaged and it's leaking. I'm like, <laughs> can you sit on a stand in front of a judge or sit in an EUO and say it never leaked before? Well, it did leak once. And I'm like, that's the problem. And right. I said, it's insurance companies are not, they're not warranty service agents. Right, exactly. Warranty. And give me an example. I said, well, here's an example. Take a brand new Cadillac Escalade and put a power washer on the window seam. You're going to get rain through it or water through it. Now go drive that Cadillac for the next 20 years and you're not going to get water through it again. I said, one time failure of pressurized water doesn't damage the item. Now, subsequently, that water could have came down and gotten the electric panel handle the door and damage something, but that gasket's not permanently damaged from one time having pressure water get through it. So now when we go to make that argument for a genuine gasket failure, window seal failure, you know, you're back to that being able to argue it like you're on a biblical crusade. You know, there's passion there. There's honesty, you know, it's just, it's important. Right. And what made you, what made you uh, go from being an IA working on the other side and becoming a PA, Frank? I'm going to give you the political answer. Sure. That's fine. Um, as long as it's entertaining. It, yeah. I, there was a couple of reasons. Primarily, it let me sleep in my zip code. Um, I worked, I missed like a, a kid being born, I think, a uh, high school graduation, so many birthdays you can't count. Um, my dad passed away a few years ago. Uh, I got to work on the road with him, but I didn't get to work on the road with my mom. So, you know, all those years with your mom, my wife, um, literally coming home. And I grew up playing in bands and stuff. And, uh, you know, you listen to songs like Journeys forever faithfully you know I, I come home you have to you have to get to know your wife again you know i've gone five six months your kids kind of don't want to go near you um, wow. and then the back end of my career working in florida i worked uh, south florida so i slept monday through friday on a boat down in miami because my dad and i had a sport fishing boat and uh, he he also worked in that area and uh then you know you get home and you get a couple days home and then you're back in miami and then right. you know you think about moving to miami and for me it just it for our kids and the high paced lifestyle down there, it wasn't advantageous for us. So, um, as someone, you know. as someone who's from Miami, it, it, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's bad. And then, you know, I, so I got traffic. to where I was work my way up enough that I was working some pretty complex claims. And then you start getting the drive by shootings and stuff, man. And I mean, it's hard. I, I don't know if anyone on this podcast has ever dealt with an insurance loss where someone has died in the action of it. Um, it, it, those are some of the hardest claims. I, I look at like EMS people and nurses and doctors and police officers, how they keep a sane brain. The little bit I've seen in my career and dealing that with on a daily basis has got to be just a personal hell. Some of the mitig some of these mitigation companies, they do that. They specialize in, do in doing that. They go out. You know they... what, man? And I just cut them straight out of it. Them too. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I had one in Tampa where a body erupted. They passed away. And um, I, I actually got reprimanded for paying the claim. It was a DP3 and I paid it under uh, eruption because the body erupted. That's literally what it said in the coroner report. And uh, Oh, so you're talking about, you're talking about on the carrier side, you had a lot of these claims. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? Is that, was that like what you were specialized in, I guess, for a little time being? You were that? No, but it seemed to be the carriers that I was working for. You had to be around that carrier for a while before they would let you deal with something that sensitive because, right. you know, they're human beings and they realize they want to send someone else first day on the job and the guys out there, you know. So you had so. to go out there and you'd have to scope a loss, take photos, put together an estimate, put together your report. Wow. Yeah, husband lost his job, came home, blew his head off, and the wife comes home and finds him, you know. Eventually they file an insurance claim because... Right. I've had only one claim like that. And I saw the photos and it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. I had one claim yeah. where, where the mitigation company is that who actually referred it to me and, um, and there was just blood all over the place. Yeah, and those, are, those and, are hard to work. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's intense. Um, but what's cool is now that you're on the PA side, one thing I noticed about your, your company coastal claims is you've got that son of a gun set up like an insurance company, man. It is, it is badass. I mean, this thing is like a machine. Uh, 
explain explain to the PAs on here the machine that you've got working over there because it is awesome. Um, yeah, so I guess you stick in what you know. So you know we have a CRM um, we use, and um, I, I looked at a lot of different ones. Um, we have uh, human resources. Uh, we have claims intake liaison specialists that actually import the claims, the data, scheduling. Uh, we have some PAs that okay. Don't get the field. Don't, don't don't get all like crazy with some of the words that you're using too. A claims liaison. That's just the person who takes in the claims, right? Like a tech. Uh, the what what yeah. did they call it? Uh, yeah, like first notice loss people when you call an insurance company. Yeah, I know, but I remember when I was in State Farm, I was a claims adjuster, but then there was also the person a little bit of a step down, and they were the claims um, claims not technician. Damn it, I can't remember the word. But okay, gotcha. All right, they take in the claim. Them when I was there. So. Okay, they take I mean, in the claim. They take in the facts. Them, of, I didn't. They take in the facts bad. of loss, and they and they upload everything to the to the to the CRM. So you've got everything yep. sort of ready to go, and then the claims adjuster takes over. Yeah, we have uh, we have some guys that just want to work like a field adjuster, like a like an IA does for an insurance company. Uh, we have some guys that are a little bit older or fell off a roof or whatever in their career, and they want to sit behind a desk and argue claims. They're all licensed. Um, you know, that's a big thing. Licensing, even our internal staff are in process, even though they don't touch claims. I don't ever want the allegations. So they're all in process of getting their PA license or already have them. Uh, even people that don't work claims. Um, then we, we do have a handful of guys and gals that are just uh, out there in the field and they cradle to grave their product. And uh, we, we offer very little no assistance to them other than infrastructure and support. Um, we have operational officers, two operational officers that write programs, training and assisting. Uh, we just recently hired a director of operations to work under the operational officers between them. And then we have uh, team leads that are just uh, account managers or adjuster managers. Uh, we have four attorneys that are um, non first party attorneys. These attorneys literally do not even understand or comprehend or care about first party uh, business attorneys. Uh, we have uh, one that works as a compliance officer um, for licensing. Um, one that is our CFO. The other one is our vice president. He's an equal partner with myself. And um, and we have uh, you've got accounts the, receivable. You've got the appraisal department. You've got estimators. <laughs> Yeah, we do have estimators. We also have a gal here. She's, uh, she's, I believe, licensed at this point to train, exact, teach Xactimate. I, I, I don't want to overspeak. I'd have to ask her. Um, but she handles the estimators. We have duplicators that just duplicate estimates for our people that just take the carrier estimate, recreate an Xactimate. And then um, <clears throat> we have a full-blown appraisal department. Um, uh, appraisal director's name is Ben. And then we have a litigated the support department, which is basically support by the appraisal department and um, then I do the majority of our mediations so we have uh, interactive conference centers that work for mediations I love the zoom mediations we're gonna jump into a mediation conversation after this for sure and um, then we have our educational officer so we are actually I'm hoping to have it out and I, I put it on one of Pate's things a few months ago it's funny you mentioned them we, we are in the process of buying a new building and um, also dormitories for an adjuster school and uh, we hope to have that product rolled out by next year. We're working on um, finding the educational partners, the collaborative partners, um, having some other people bring in some of the programming. Uh, we're going to offer a virtual and in-class training and that uh, will the full program, I mean the whole kit and caboodle and I'm talking marine, aviation, Oh wow! Prop, uh, that'll be an 11 week program. Um, so, but when we'll, we're going to offer financing for it. So uh, you know, I know like I looked at going to an adjuster school way back in the day and it was, Hey, fly to Colorado, pay us up front, right. find your own room, your own board, your own this. And it, I mean, it's like nine grand or 14 grand. Right. Um, and now it's up, 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 up. Um, we will, I, I don't know what the market price of it'll be. It'll be robust financially. We don't have to get into all that stuff. It's going to be spread out to where it's payments and, you know, a small down payment, but the campus and the dorm is going to be huge. That's freaking um, awesome. I mean, that's so yeah. great. I mean, I, we have to give back. We have to give back to this community because number one is there's just not a lot of resources for PA to really learn how to do things and how to do things correctly. Um, that's the biggest thing. And the number two, I think, you know, once we gain all this knowledge that we've got, you especially, man, I think the, 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 the greatest thing to do is just to sort of give back and see how we could help the industry. Because like I said, it's only going to help the policyholders at the end of the day if we're doing our Big job time. the way we're supposed Big to. Big time for sure. 
Um, one other neat little thing with the school we're going to do is uh, there's going to be a one week program too for contractors just to know where that our opinion of where that line of the UPA stands and how close they can get to it in our opinion and how close they should stay away from it. And because there's a lot, of, I, I honestly meet a ton of roofers that have a really hard time with the negotiation and ex arguing scope and dollars. And they come hand in hand, in my opinion. So saying, hey, Mr. Insurance Company, our client had blue shingles on the roof and you paid for green, seems to be okay-ish. But saying our client had blue shingles and you paid for green and blue are more expensive and you need to pay more. Now you're kind of getting and negotiate. I'm giving a very, very lighthearted stretch there. I think we need to educate the roofers and the general contractors just on the, not on that, not only on that, but just on the benefit of having us on their side. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like and they, they want to handle it. Out there, man. They want to handle it themselves. They want to be able to do it. They don't want to give the, they don't want to give up any more percentage to a public adjuster to handle it. But at the end of the day, number one, like you said, we need to make sure, uh, well, we know obviously a lot more about the policy. But the other thing is, I think it just makes their lives a little bit easier. Let this PA handle it. Let him go ahead and do what he has to do. I'll go to go on to the next job and then we'll get another PA for that one or that PA for this one. Let him do what he specialized in like we talked about. Let everybody focus on what they're specialized in. So, so yeah, so you're 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 saying off sheet of music I like. Here's the deal. Um, most most PAs don't like claims under 200 grand, 100 grand. Um, I'll take claims for $500. I don't care. I take them all. We got to help. Care. Everybody needs help. So, so once you get past that hurdle, you know, I've explained to a couple of contracts we work with and it's the same pitch, but everyone ends up with a different avenue. But you know, the first thing that I tell them is look, you, you want to compromise the integrity and the value and the classification of your fiscal relationship with your client. Go right ahead. Like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, I fired my dentist because I also found out he was working on cars on the weekends at his house for clients then it's a joke but like you're the contractor hold that license coveted hold that education coveted like but don't act as an attorney and a public adjuster also and now that we get past the ego thing and i had a friend of mine tell me i was very young like kill your ego it's the best thing you can do and a lot of people have a hard time with that you know so kill the ego okay so i'm just going to do this i was working on my grass last night that's why my fingers are black put the sod down um <laughs> so yeah, i can't get it to come off and they're scrubbing so anyways um the next step for them is they try to remind them so i'm like hey you know now let's look at it from a dollar and cent standpoint. You sign the client, you know there's storm damage and they already tell you they have a claim. How many more times are you coming back? Oh, three or four. Like sometimes five. I'm so like, what? how many more roofs could you have sold? Because exactly. my guys will do that four or five. Like, they, and they'll do it well. That's their job. Or call Vince, he'll do it well. I got right. a buddy of mine, Ryan James over in Tampa, call Ryan, you know? Like, why would you want to put that much focus into one of them? <laughs> is beyond me. It's, it's like the PA that, you know, has 12 clients that want to sign and he's, he's inspecting two a day and getting off at two o'clock. Doesn't make sense. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And just, it's like I said, it's just have the, have the experts in their industry focus on what they're experts at and, you know, go on to the next one. I mean, they like you said, they could just sign so many other more, they could sign so many other jobs uh, while we're doing what we have to do. And then you get the, can you do it cheaper? Oh, of course. Yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. I like I, all the time. Someone's like, Hey, can I pay 15%? And I'm going to say, yep, but it's a reduction of 25% of it. So I'm going to give you 75% of my efforts. There you go. Exactly. I like it. Or why don't you ask them to lower their, to lower their costs as well? You know, I mean, get out of here. Yeah. You're um, telling me you get 650 a square when everyone else is at 490 or 510. Right. And then you're going to complain that I'm charging 20%. Exactly. Like, you know, exactly. Respectively. Yeah. Um, so how many, how many people you got working over there now? <laughs> How many, how many adjusters? I, you don't have to get into it if you don't want to. I always get concerned. Like there's a running joke. like, oh, you're giving Frank math. Cause like I, a round number, you know, yeah, I like my the, brain works. So that's how mine works too. I think we're about 53 people at our entity right now. That's um, awesome. But if someone goes and goes to our webpage, there's probably only like 39 listed. Yeah. We update it every two months. So I, normally we don't put someone that came on. Like if I hire an inspector, I'm not going to put them on the Facebook page until they get past their 90 days, because if they leave it just, you know, you're constantly taking people on and off. So, but I think there's about 53 people that are in instruction in just overall. Yeah. So I just want to give people just sort of like a mental picture. Like when I walked in there last week, it was just, it's just, it's just a really cool place. I mean, it's a really cool place. Organized chaos. Yeah. I No, yeah. It didn't look like chaos at all. It's just like everybody sort of knows their role. Everybody where they have to be. Uh, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the guys that I had on the podcast, a good friend of mine, his name is Eric Wang. And he's actually, uh, he's a, 
he runs a an apparel company out in Texas, uh, over a hundred million dollars in revenue a year or something like that. And um, he's got how many employees? He's got he's got like over a hundred or two hundred employees. He's got he's got a ton, and he really specializes in. Uh, he's doing business coaching now, and he specializes in understanding people's strengths, understanding people's weaknesses, and uh, uh, grouping people to their different things. For, for, so, for example, the person that you have sort of behind the desk in a cubicle isn't going to have necessarily the same strength as the person who's going out there signing claims and hustling as a sales guy, uh, working the claims, negotiating, stuff like that. They're going to have sort of different things. One might be sort of low attention to detail, while the other one might be sort of high action and uh, want to move. Focused, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. And he's able to sort of form teams. Well, I'm only bringing that up because when I went in there, it really looks like you've managed to sort of put everybody in their right place. Uh, everybody's sort of doing what they're doing. Looks like everybody's sort of in their strengths where they have to be. Everything seemed very organized to me. And then after you told me and you broke everything down about the number of adjusters and how the claim comes in and how do you process the whole thing and almost every claim you you touch almost every claim right because then even while you and i were talking i mean those emails were coming in everything was sort of non-stop i was surprised you were willing to give me the two hours uh just for this podcast uh because you know you you do a lot you, you're a hell of a leader man and i think just the operation that you got going on there is it's 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 really something to admire it's really cool man Wow. Thank you. Um, that's an awfully beautiful compliment, especially from you. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is you walk into my office and I've got like five people going, Holy that's, that's. <laughs> yeah. You walked in there as like a celebrity, you know? And, uh, the second you left, like, it's like, Hey, you know, you should do some stuff with them. I've been following in for you. Anyways, I digress. Um, so you, I think you probably do a lot of the same things. I, I ran for city commission in new Smyrna beach about 15, 10 years ago. And I took this program, uh, DISC program, at the recommendation of a friend of mine that's a judge. DISC? DISC? I believe that was it. Yeah, it was an acronym, and I forget, long since forgot what it was. But it, it was a, a twofold program. It was one to help clean up oneself, and then the other one was to associate your strengths and weaknesses. And um, it, it started out very sophomorically. Just don't tell people you promised them 110% because that's ignorant as hell. Um, um, don't say irregardless because it means regardless, regardless, you know, don't, <laughs> don't say, let me be honest with you because that implies you've been lying the rest of the time. <laughs> and then it moved on to uh, finding your personality types. And I have a first party attorney I'm friends with Derek Hendricks and he got recently into the same thing. And he goes, and I love Derek. We're a bit alike. And he calls me up and he goes, man, he goes, what a day. He goes, I didn't take this kind of this oatmeal tree huggy thing. And, yeah. you know, turn Turns out I'm every type of personality. And I go, dude, I did this a few years ago and it's the same thing. And the guy came back to me and he goes, hey, dude, he goes, you're, he, he goes, you're not fake, but he goes, you're a chameleon. You're A when you're around A people. You're B when you're around B people. He goes, he's what you are is you're damn good at negotiating. I had never negotiated much at that point. And I'm like, well, thanks for the compliment. But one of the biggest things I took from that program was to exploit people's strengths and cradle their weaknesses. Um, to take a good opportunity, but don't be an opportunist. You know, like don't look to take opportunity, but if a good opportunity presents itself. So at Coastal, we have, um, it's a running joke and the guys get sick of hearing it. The gals do. If we get to a point where someone is failing at something or if someone's excelling at something, but we see another area where they're stronger, we encourage that placement. Um, and that's been immensely beneficial. I would love in some eulogy for someone to say what a smart person I was and I designed that I didn't do any of this by myself at all at not even remotely good for you um you know this every hurdle we have hit in the road we have found a reasonable way around it based off of people and their infrastructure and i, I will tell you uh, matthew peterson one of our attorneys here and he is a he is a majority holder with me um oh i don't know if we would have stayed in business without him he didn't do anything great but he took a chance we were at a time where our growth was so rapid we needed good legal advice um you know when we opened this company i took a moratorium on salary for five years um, i won't get too deep into it but i still currently take less than six uh no i take ninety seven thousand dollars a year there you go i talk about being open. Oh, okay <laughs> um and that's on a, that's you know but the reason is not because we're cash starved is it's reinvesting everything back absolutely in. how much money do you need let's face it 
was kind of the approach we took. I sat down with my wife and I, and we figured out our absolute bare net net to pay our bills and then a couple of hundred dollars a week spending money. And, uh, you know, but I used to make considerably more than that. If the IRS is listening, it's been a stable market. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to the end of that five years. I'm looking forward to a little growth for myself and sure. reinvesting into retirement, things like that. But um, the and, and, and I am not on an island alone here. This company has had a myriad of people that have made sacrifices and concession exchange. But when we look for someone new, I mean, I like to hire people that are retired or been trained somewhere else, you know, and just moved or couldn't work, but nothing's by our HR director. I didn't have to train her to do HR. She was, how do you, was I retired at HR. How do you find, how do you find the adjusters and stuff? Cause I'm sort of in that growth phase myself. So how do you, how do you find the right people and how do you sort of get the word out there? I guess, do you interview? Let me tell you how to do it wrong. <laughs> well, um, that's good to know too. I assumed because of myself that you just hire carrier people. <laughs> Not necessarily a good thing. Some of my best adjusters come from the carrier side. Some of my best adjusters were roofing contractors. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Figure it out. I don't, I, I literally, one of my best adjusters doesn't know how to swing a hammer. Okay. You think construction experience is paramount? It's not. Okay. It's, it's not, you know, so we just had the dumb luck. I've had a lot of, um, I've had a lot of IAs call about two months later and go, hey man, uh, you know, I've been thinking about switching for years and you guys were just so cool and just what I want to be, you know, where do you live? Well, I live in, you know, do you do, do you do any kind of advertising or anything like that to find the, or they just keep calling you? We'll run a Facebook ad, like okay. hiring estimators. Okay. Uh, we do some outreach program with underprivileged uh, people in the okay. community. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a rough crowd. So I try not to have too many kids or minors in here. They just, you know, you get someone on the phone, damn it, they fucking said right. You know, um, and you know, I want to let kids be kids, man. Childhood's so short, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. we try to find people that are of age adults. You know, if you're going to move into licensing, you got to be an adult anyways. Um, right, right. Estimators are some argument. You could hire some high school kids. But uh, it's just, like I said, we can be a little bit of a rough crowd. And our office is very Google-esque, the way it's it's open and very relaxed. I've been uh, criticized immensely from outside contemporaries about that, but oh, for whatever. us, it's good. I don't, if someone can only work 31 hours, they only work 31 hours. If someone right. can work 42, they work 42. You have any kind of, um, you have any kind of training program? We do. You do? Uh, good, good, good. Full on onboard training program. Um, so Heidi Haskell, she's uh, a minority owner here in the company. Uh, uh, paralegal and she runs the administrative side of the company. So she, she does onboarding and training. I think uh, we, you know, anyone that comes in to work on the paperwork side of things, um, they do a full two weeks, maybe three weeks. And then um, the adjusters, when they come in, uh, Todd Moorhead, who's one of my partners and actually a childhood friend, um, he's got a training program orchestrated a la carte menu. So when guys come in, if they're really good at soliciting, nice. they can pick up some piece of the action once they're like licensed and et cetera. So yeah, and that runs, I think six months to a year. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, mediation. What do you want to talk about? This is like your and I's passion. I love it. <laughs> so our mediation right now, um, when I was on the carrier side and I would run mediations, you would get sent with a $500 financial authority or twenty five. <laughs> exactly. That's why I used to hate that shit. Well, I used my, to hate it. It was a waste is, of time. It's failed from the word jump street because if you're telling a person they can't settle a claim, <laughs> you know, what was the point of going to mediation? So I feel as if they're going into it the wrong way. But this beautiful thing happened happened as a byproduct of the catalyst and not COVID, but as of COVID, which means courts are slowing down. Uh, Zoom is a big thing. And alternative dispute is becoming a little bit more honest than it might have previously been. So where I used to tell my guys, like, they'd be like, hey, they're going to go to mediation. I'm like, you better hurry up and get it into appraisal. I'm like, hey, man, right. let's go to mediation because yep. it's not binding and it's honest. You're in a tree of safety, you know, and, uh, and there's no risk. Players. It's high reward and low risk. Yeah. You know, so maybe not high reward, you know, but you know, it's low risk. Yeah. You know, it is all I can tell you is our best mediation to date was zero to 75,000. I don't, you know, that to me, I'm like, my own, my only thing I will say with mediation is, uh, I've had a couple mediations where because the client was put on the spot, they took so much less than what I sort of thought 
they should have gotten. And I think it was just mostly, and you know, we went on our sidebar and I'm like, look, I said, it's here. I said, caucus, caucus, caucus. you know, my estimates, my estimates way over here. And he's just like, no, 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 I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm like, are you sure? Because there's other steps that we can take And it happened twice. Uh, I mean, one and a half. The other one wasn't too bad, but one of them was just like, I mean, he took just way less than what I think he should have, but you know, what are you going to do? do? Uh, we do a half hour prep before the mediation. I do there like a clients, 15 so I let minute them prep. drive where they want to drive. And I just tell them, look, do you, you you're allowed to do whatever you want here. So right. do you want to sit idly by and just let them acknowledge you're on here? Do you want to be involved? I, the vast majority of people go, look, man, this is your show. I, I'll yeah. be there. And so when the other side comes in and you know, what's the famous thing you do your opening and you say, and this is why I feel the roof should be paid. The mediator says, okay, a good mediator says, okay, let's move on to the next guy. Instead of asking 800 questions. Um, I've had a couple of mediators that honestly, that almost steered the mediation, like they were negotiating, you know, it just, it was difficult, but anyways, on normal, it goes over to the other side and then lo and behold, what do they do? You know, they want to break into cocker. So they want to get a first offer. The first offer, if it's genuine and I tell the clients, I'm like, look, the first offer is $5,000. We're probably not going anywhere. So they're giving their full authority. If the first offer is, you know, 12,296 and we're looking for 40, we're probably going somewhere. And then of course they always think I'm a genius. Well, how did you know that they went right to 5,000? I'm like, well, I told you before. Right. Cause that was his full authority. They're telling you, I believe in your loss, but I can't go any higher, whatever. So, you know, we get to that point and I, I, I'll turn to the client and I'll tell them, I'll say, look, you got to offer $5,000 on the table after you pay me, after you pay your deductible, <laughs> after you pay for your roof yeah. and after you pay for the nine sheet of plywood that you'll have to pay for that should have not been considered for coverage anyways, you know, you're going to write a check for about $14,000. I would not recommend you taking this offer, but it's your show. Right. And then normally they go, no, I don't want to take it. And you know, you jump into caucus and please, if there's any attorneys on here and I'm saying it, I'm paraphrasing for starters, but I try to give it to them. Like, I think this is a good offer. I think this isn't a good offer. I think this is in your best interest. I don't think it's your best, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. But mediations, we're running like, man, liar's poker here. I think I told you like 89.7% success. It's right around there. You know, I'll do the math and I'll write it down. It changes every few days, but we're running a great success rate, but everyone assumes 89%. All right. So one see, loses and then this many are going to win. It, and it, it, it uh, seems five like lose and then you go on a run of wins. It seems know? like the adjusters are getting a little bit more leeway, a little bit more authority on what they could actually negotiate. I mean, the last one I went to, she jumped right out the box with like, I think, I mean, you don't know the whole details of the claim, but like 15,000, I was like, whoa, okay, this is, this, this is nice. We're Just right out the box. Music. They start at 14,000, you're going somewhere. You know, you, know? you dance it, you're pairing. We had one the other day that, uh, I'll give it to Todd Moorhead, man. He, I, he showed it to me and I'm like, yeah, you ain't going nowhere on this one, we good luck. And I sat right here and listened to him. He sits right over my shoulder. No one's in the owner's office right now. We all sit in a big office together. Um, but uh, man, he drove it all the way from zero dollar denial with an engineer to a thirty thousand dollar payment. Like, so, so when I was younger, uh, I'd get a denial, and a denial when I was younger, it was just like litigation, denial, litigation, denial. I'm not even gonna try litigation. Then I got to the point where okay, denial, mediation, denial, mediation. Now I'm more denial. Let me send in my LOR. Let me contact the desk adjuster. Let me send a nice letter. Super nice. How's your Friday going? Happy weekend. What can we work out? Here's my arguments. Here's my photos. Like I got one now. I got recently that they denied it because they, the adjuster couldn't find any damage. The field adjuster. Mind you, the water mitigation guy that referred me the claim went over there and he sends me like 35 photos of water damage. So I'm like, okay, what, there's, what's going on here? So I sent her the photos and said, let's see what we could work out. So we're in the process of doing that. But my point is, is that now it's going to be more, let me see what I could work out. Okay, if you're still saying no, my next step is not going to be litigation. I'm going to file for mediation. Yeah. And let's yeah. see what happens there. And two things, for me, two things happens there. Is in the beginning, I used to feel bad as a public adjuster of signing your claim and then going straight to a lawyer. I oh, God, yeah, it feels like crap. I didn't do anything. Yeah. Why, why are you even hiring? I should just be, ref I just, you should just go hire an attorney. Yeah. Let me rescind my LOR. Yeah. I'm exactly. Like, Public adjusters, you have to at least put in some freaking work before you, if you expect to get paid. So at the very least, I think if there's well, a denial. Thank you out of Miami. Is that why you're not there? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so if I, if, if, if at the very least, I think if there's a denial, at least go the mediation route. I like the extra step of actually trying to discuss it as a human to the desk adjuster and say, Hey, look, I'm here with you. Uh, our 
our co- my biggest thing when I'm negotiating is I try to remind them of the of the common of the common interest and the common interest that we both have should be the policyholder. You know, so let's and I, I humanize every single one of my claims. I mean, I talk about all. I mean, look at this photo of the poop coming up in the toilet and in the bathtub right now. Uh, this is what this person's dealing with. You know, I know you may not know that you might not have been to the house, but just look at this photo and look what they're dealing with. And a lot of times it works out <laughs> most of the time. Uh, it, it, the, the humanizing. Sorry, we went off. We went off subject a little bit. My bad. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm with it. The humanizing is key. And I think, I think you brought up something there. Like anything, when you're vamping, it kind of brings it around. I have tons of times I'm talking to people. Well, I just, Mr. Dalton Ailey is not acceptable for four months. And I'm thinking, you know, Kersanda, she's 83 years old. Her husband died nine months ago of smog cell lung cancer. Her granddaughter got admitted into Harvard six weeks ago. Her children are actually, you know, borrowing money from her to help cover the tuition. Like, how well do you know your client and the circumstance? And when can you validate that it is or isn't? I have one that uh, we had a, we had a family and uh, two of the children were autistic. And uh, man, I was over there and a door slammed. You want to talk about sainted people and organized chaos. Their children just had a defense mechanism or whatever was proper. They, they would break into screaming hysterical fits at a, at a loud noise. And I got a claims examiner telling me that two days of ALE wasn't warranted while putting on a roof. I mean, you know, there's no, there's no shoe box for this industry. There's no one size fits all. And, you know, not everybody is going to go to you and say, Hey, here's my handicaps. Here's my weaknesses because they'll feel like they're exploiting it. But if you have a homeowner that's asking for ALE and, and for three days or five days, you know, the carrier should be looking and going, perhaps there's a reason, but the adjuster should also know firsthand that relationship. You know, you, you need to know your clients. You know, I think a big strength that you could even probably go to your guy who said is a great adjuster and knows no construction experience. I think a big thing, a big strength and a big skill that it takes to learn in this industry is communication and it's communication with the other side. We have to know how to communicate with them because if we just go in guns blazing and we want to, we want to just pick a fight which there's public adjusters out there that do that because they're just offended. Again, it's the ego thing. But if you just go in there and you just want to pick a fight, that's 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 not how you're going to get anything resolved. You're not going to get anything resolved like that. And mediation is the same way. You got to let just just be cool, man. And I tell my guys that a lot, like the, the guys that never worked on the career side. I'm like, you guys think I'm so smart. I did this and I did that. And I'm like, first off, <laughs> shame on you for not knowing I'm not that smart. But second off, if you think I am, there was people that trained me there. I knew nothing. So you're fighting with people that have access to that like make sure your argument is valid and uh i I have had some other pas reach out to me for peer review on stuff or hey man you give me some help and like yeah and i've done it with other people and it amazes me when they call and they're like you know and then they got this and they should pay for that right and i'm like what not necessarily because the water heater might leak next month they should pay for a new one like it's not home warranty you right. know like what are what are oh, some you, you come from the carrier side man that's why you see it that way i'm like <laughs> okay what are what are some of your things that you would just have to have in every file like for me for example i just run off just in my list of pretty much every single file has it's the lor i gotta take photos i like to have either uh either or a repair estimate or uh or some kind of a proposal or just expert documentation so that's like sort of all rolls into one and then uh, any kind of mitigation has to be done that's like sort of oh and then the estimate I've, I've got like five six things every single one so when i do the training i actually open up my files i share my screen with these guys and i open up my file i'm like look i'm not full of shit i just go and i pick a file and it just goes because then as the file grows of course you've got more but those five or six things every single time is there anything else that you would add or you just uh, what do you think so <laughs> we're going to parry on the same conversation we've been doing here. Um, there's so much more. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to run down a road real quick. I am not a huge fan of outside sourcing. So Eagle view. Okay. You work at a carrier and they're like, Hey man, you can get an Eagle view. You can get it for free. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm only making $300 on this phone. You're going to give me a free Eagle view. Cool. Order, 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 order. So when my guys use those, I, they're great for validating factors. So yes, put that in there as well. But I want a physical sketch and here's why I want it. Our licensing is not that difficult to get. I think it probably should be a little bit harder. And I we agree. have the same license that the IAs have and the, the staff guys have. Um, 
that when you set a 10 year boulder and rolling down a hill of the Eagle view, eventually somebody is going to go to the state and go, Hey, we've had these licensed professionals agree with our measurements a hundred percent of the time. Why are their licenses important? Why can't we just have a computer do all this? And that day is a coming. Um, they're starting to do internal measurements now, uh, virtual inspection, Matterport and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So uh, my guys, I, I want it sketched. I want it organic. And we find quite frequently, and if you go to on there, they'll probably want to come shoot me. Um, maybe not then, but we find consistent inconsistencies in estimating tools huh. and systems. So do they normally make a big difference? No, but I, I still, I want that. I want to be able to double check. I also want the property appraiser's data. I want the property appraiser's footprint. I want to see if that structure that I am arguing didn't exist on a building permit because there might be an issue of coverage because of application issues. So I want to see that the named insured Jonah Smith owns the property and it's not owned by Richard Wilson, a third cousin who might have a shareholder and me not being able to sign on that file. So, you know, wow. property appraisers data, uh, plus it's great to double check the footprint of the house. And if you take that property appraiser's footprint, you have a footprint of the house. So now when you're there, put it on your clipboard, it's a lot easier to get the sketch because you already have the outside parameter. So uh, we use those. Um, so my operational officers created a thing where we also do a 360 pick image. It's great for estimators because for a $130 camera, set it in the middle of the room, you can scroll that picture around like a ball, like a mouse ball. You can look at the floor, look at the baseboard, look at the court around, see the T-molding, count the can lights. You know, nothing's worse than going, okay, I see three in this one and half a ceiling fan, then two in this one and half a ceiling fan. So that 360 picture, you count all the recessed trim, the lights, the, you know, like I, I can't tell you, I have never once seen a carrier estimate where it says detach and reset smoke detector on a ceiling. But I see them in every picture. So, you know, we like those. But again, I think we're singing from the same sheet of music, a well-documented file. Um, we have a client information sheet. I like to see affirmed contact information that we know how to get a hold of the client. We have an email address that's not bouncing back undeliverable. Um, you know, we do try to ask the client on initial interview and a lot of guys say it's one line in our information page, what's your availability for inspection? Some people are like, I can't do it Monday through Friday. Do you give client statements? I, I give them statements sometimes. Yeah, we give them access to our CRM. So. No, no, but like, do you, not statements like that. I mean like recorded statements, like your own recorded statements statements. <laughs> Do you, ever, um, do you ever do no, that? No, I don't because I, I, I'm a, I'm not a fan of creating a discoverable item that doesn't need to be there. So I don't do recorded statements unless there would be a reason for me to do them. Um, we do prep clients on what to expect if they get a recorded statement request. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just, hey, they're going to ask you questions. Um, if you don't know something, please don't elaborate or embellish. You know, they don't care about your nephew's insurance claim in Denver last month. Right. You know, right. um, <clears throat> stuff like that. Well, wow, that's intense, Frank. I like that. I like that whole the 360 image. I like that, that you go and you get the appraisal uh, documentation from the appraiser's office. That's, that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's good things. And I mean, it helps you. It, you know, normally something smells funny, you know why it is. And I, I tell you, when you look at the footprint of the house and you see it's 5,479 square feet and it's a 612 pitch roof and the carrier agreed to pay for the whole roof and it's 32 squares, something's up. Right, Like right. Somewhere there's a mistake. So That's awesome. I had, a, I had a file, one of my guys did that. He was six weeks on it. <laughs> Turned out as all it was was a difference and their, their adjuster didn't measure two of the facets of the roof. I mean, communication, it goes back to what you said before. One conversation would have prevented six weeks of his life work. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Frank, uh, I mean, I guess I, all I would like for you to add is uh, any, any, any tips and not tricks, but any tips or any advice that you would give to any new upcoming public adjusters in regards to whether they're starting their own firm or just handling of the claims process or anything in general before we sort of let you go and into your holiday party. Sure. 
Sure. Um, so the one big thing, this is my big thing for this year. So I'm really jamming on it. Um, we're not philanthropists in this industry. We are working, but um, do not advertise and beg people to use you and then find out they have a managed repair program and tell them, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Oh. Have a little bit of a integrity to what you do. God, that's something we could have talked gonna about. You are going to do some for free. You are going to do some non-rev. You are going to do some reduced rev. You are going to do some more clients say, can I make payments to you? Um, protect our industry. Uh, don't make us out to be the person that is there to help you out in your time of need, unless it's not beneficial for me than pound sand. So if you get that insurance company that has their own construction company, what's it? what are you going to do? You're going to do six hours of your time. Help those people out, man. Stay on. Let them in. Also, let them start the work and let's see how it turns out anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that argument's always there, but you know, um, yeah, man. I mean, help. Literally, we're in an, it, people that drive fire trucks are getting paid, but there's a passion there. Those are always the people you see stopping at three in the morning, saving someone's life. Be that person if you're going to be a public adjuster. If you're here to help consumers and to be an advocate for them, don't be that sterile ass nine to five, what's in it for me person. You know? I agree. Look at us. We're going to do whatever we can to help each other out. So that's right, man. That's what it's all about. Uh, Frank, Merry Christmas. Same to you. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time because I know uh, you've got you've got yourself a busy schedule. So I really appreciate you taking the time for us. And uh, honestly, nothing but the best of luck to you. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch, man. Same to you, my friend. We'll see you real soon. All right. See you, Frank. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye.